Well, good, e good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to tonight's event, Impacting the World as the Energy University. I'm Rich Bundy, and I have the privilege of serving Penn State as Vice President for Development and Alumni Relations. Uh, and tonight, I also get to be your MC. So in that role as MC, I have a few uh, housekeeping notes to share before we get our program started. First and foremost, uh, this session is being recorded and will be shared with those of us who couldn't be here tonight but might be interested in, in uh, this evening's topic. Your microphones should be currently muted, but we encourage you to turn on your cameras so that we can see you as we go through the program. There's also closed captioning available tonight. Uh, you should be able to turn the closed captioning on or off by clicking closed caption in the control bar, which for most people will be at the bottom of your screen. As you think about questions for our speakers tonight, and we will have a Q&A at the end of the program, please enter those questions into the chat box, uh, which also should be located at the bottom of your screen. And I will uh, facilitate those questions uh, at the end of the program this evening. We may not have enough time to get through all of the questions, but if uh, past sessions are prelude to this evening, uh, we'll get through most of them and, and uh, should be able to, to get to your question as well. But if for some reason we're not able to, uh, we'll be sure to follow up with you at a later date. So with that, uh, let's jump into this evening's programming. We're closing in, as many of you know, on the final year of a greater Penn State for 21st century excellence, our current uh, multi-year comprehensive campaign. And with the end in sight, our vision for what we can achieve is really only growing. We're thinking right now about how we can maximize the potential of each campaign imperative to open doors, to create transformative experiences and to impact the world in order to make a difference in the Penn State community throughout the Commonwealth and around the globe. With just over a year left, we're thinking big because our, we know our potential is great. And tonight you'll hear about how we're using that potential to tackle some of the big questions facing the planet. The intersection of climate, food, water, energy challenges in order to position Penn State as the energy university. We've invited you here this evening because we think this topic will be of interest to you. And we're excited to share how your philanthropy can play a part in our efforts to impact the world. So without further ado, to get things started, it's my honor to introduce the 18th president of Penn State and his wife, Dr. Eric Barron and Molly Barron. Eric? Thank you, Rich. Um, I, uh, Molly and I are both really excited to be here with you um, this evening. And I'm going to start right out with a, a PowerPoint presentation here, which will load up on the screen here. OK, so the topic impacting the world as the energy university and the next slide. So we intend to bring together the diverse breadth and depth of our very powerful research and educational institution to address, to address enduring issues. And as a matter of fact, this is something a university like Penn State can do that other universities cannot do. It's because we're very good, we, we have a lot of depth, but we also have the breadth that it takes to address truly challenging and enduring problems. So next. So what is this theme? It, it isn't a theme of to become the energy university. It's a theme to focus on the energy security of this nation and the world. And what that means is you want it to be affordable. You want it to be accessible. You want it to be safe and clean. And you want to maximize the use of energy as an economic engine. Next. Now we see and have a, you know, more than a century of, of uh, records of, of the use of energy and fossil fuels have made up at least 80% of that mix since 1900. There's a growth in renewables. It's going to continue, but not fast enough to offset the effects of expanding global economies and population. So this tells us that we have a, a challenge. Next. So that challenge and Penn State 
is sitting in a commonwealth that is an energy state. Nation's second largest natural gas producer after Texas, ranked second in electricity generation from nuclear power, third largest coal producing state, second largest coal exporter to foreign markets in, in, in integrating natural gas, renewables, batteries, and building and grid technologies to deliver clean, safe, abundant, and affordable energy. Next. So looking at the trends, what we might expect, uh, there are a number of estimates out there that suggest that energy requirements will increase by 50% by 2040. That's not that long. Net CO2 emissions need to decrease because of the negative impacts of it. Fossil fuel use continues. So that suggests the need for carbon capture and sequestration. And uh, one of the most important topics is that U.S energy independence is a huge part of national security, U.S. national security. They go hand in hand. And finally, as another uh, trend uh, or important trend is that the regulatory and policy environment needs to match the modern day and the future evolution of use of, of energy. Next. So we have challenges. We have a technical challenge. It requires good science, innovative engineering solutions. Energy is a political challenge. It's polarizing, it's partisan. People have very different viewpoints uh, on energy, many times uh, uh, viewpoints that, that are not based in fact. Solutions are also an implementation challenge. They need sound economic law, policy and social frameworks or they won't be effective. Next. So we have a vision becoming the energy university in order to tackle the problem of energy security. Penn State is greatly advantaged by the fact that we have so many colleges and campuses that can step forward in this space as a higher education leader in research, generating all that knowledge and technology that will drive uh, the, the evolution and revolution in terms of energy. Uh, we have a, a remarkable uh, workforce uh, population of faculty that prepare uh, students uh, that are both highly trained, highly adaptable, and ready for global careers and collaboration in the energy space. And we have a long history and a continuing desire to partner with industry to address urgent real world needs for energy production and policy. Next. We're well positioned. So every time I see this slide and these numbers, I sort of marvel because it tells you something about where we are in terms of achieving this goal. We have more than 464 individual investigators that touch the field of energy. Our energy research ranks sixth overall, and we have 12 different areas, very diverse, that are in the top 10 of research in energy fields. We're the only university in the US to rank in the top tier of publications across all aspects of energy research. And we're tied for first nationally in the breadth and depth of our expertise. Next. <clears throat> our educational programs are also positioned for impact. We have more energy degree programs than any other US university. 30 plus undergraduate and graduate degrees, <clears throat> excuse me, 20 undergraduate minor programs, 10 plus programs available through the world campus, 35 plus workforce development and continuing education programs, policy, law, philosophy, ethics disciplines that contribute as potential partners with the scientists and engineers that are focused on energy. Next. Penn State is also positioned for impact in terms of partnerships. And just a couple of uh, examples. We're one of 37 universities around the world 
to join the International Universities Climate Alliance. <coughs> Is there anything in that cup? Excuse me. Thanks, Molly. Molly to the rescue there. Um, we have an attitude about innovation and entrepreneurship uh, through, through Invent Penn State. So this is a mindset, which is a source for uh, startups and for intellectual property transfer. We have very strong connections to non-governmental organizations, government agencies, and national laboratories. And next. We're positioned in for impact because of our outreach programs. We are a land grant. A land grant, the very definition of a land grant is in service to society. We have an extension network that serves every county in PA. We have a robust online presence in outreach. So just look at the 2020 extension website, 22 million page views, 613,000 registrants and online courses, webinars and in-person workshops. We have strong history and capability to reach a wide set of audiences in an effort to translate science into actionable and practical solutions. Next. We are also have the potential and our position for impact because of our leadership in these areas. We look at our campuses as living laboratories in the field of energy. We're striving for net zero emissions for our campuses. Um, since 2005, we have cut our greenhouse emissions by 32%. What you're looking at is a diagram there of greenhouse gas emissions for the university with a projection in the future that is the goal for the state of Pennsylvania in terms of reductions. And the different colors are the different sources of, uh, of emissions. We are ahead of schedule and, and uh, uh, exceeding what it is that the state of Pennsylvania has uh, proposed as, as a goal. And one example of why is because um, of, of all the different partnerships and efforts that we're working on, including partnering with Light Source BP on the 70 megawatt solar farm that will supply 25% of the university's statewide electricity needs. This is the largest solar farm in the state of Pennsylvania, and it's a Penn State University project. Next. Well, so the path forward here. Our pathbreaking research education outreach efforts can serve as a catalyst to accelerate the energy transition and net zero emissions for the state, nation, and the world. It can be a catalyst for uh, for energy security for this nation and, and for the world. We're committed to advancing Pennsylvania's global leadership and responsible energy production and use, climate mitigation and community resilience. We know uh, that, that we have a population of alumni and friends that care deeply about this. So we have the potential for philanthropy to continue and, and amplify uh, these advancements that we're talking about. We seek the collaboration and support of those who share our vision to boldly pursue new research directions and partnerships to scale the impact of Penn State programs. Next. So we have many, many different areas that we're trying to advance. We have four that we would like to see uh, grow substantially that would uh, have tremendous uh, impact. These make up four key initiatives of an energy university. One is facilitating energy transitions through the Center for Energy Law and Policy. This is a focus on where science and technology are intertwined with the regulatory environment, the legal environment, and social institutions. Those and those uh, regulatory, legal, and social institutions, uh, in our mind, really need to evolve in order to match with the science and technology. And so this is an opportunity to focus on that intersection. 
The second one is a consortium for integrated energy system. And this brings together this network of expertise in renewables, non-renewables, hybrid systems, smart systems, optimal impact generation and distribution of, of energy. The third key initiative is focused on strengthening communities through a global building network, which seeks to make residential and commercial buildings where people live and work healthier, more efficient and sustainable. And the fourth is advancing literacy and leadership. In my mind, an incredibly important uh, area in terms of, of energy and the evolution of energy. And one key example is through the Drawdown Scholars Program, where research and advocacy for a wide variety of technical, ecological, and social strategies uh, can be focused to reverse global warming. Next. So that brings me to my introduction of, uh, of our drawdown uh, scholars. So this evening, that's what our focus is. We'll focus on drawdown scholars program and get an inside look at our efforts to advance energy literacy and leadership among talented students from across the nation. As I said, philanthropy is critical for supporting this program and specifically for supporting these scholars. And it has a direct connection to our campaign imperatives, opening doors to talented students from every background and ensuring that they have transformative experiences that enrich their academics and promote their success. We're very grateful for your generosity and interest in Penn State and these programs. So, so thank you. Now this evening's speakers will be Rachel Brennan, who directs the Drawdown Scholars Program, and Divya Jen, a participant in the program. First, a little bit about Dr. Brennan. She's an Associate Professor of Environmental Engineering, and she also teaches Agricultural and Biological Engineering at Penn State. Dr. Brennan is the Director of the Penn State Water, Energy, Food, Nexus Strategic Initiative, Director of the Drawdown Scholars Research Experiences for Undergraduates Programs, and Chair of the Sustainability Council for the College of Engineering. Her work aims to unite the Penn State community with public stakeholders to pursue strategies for addressing sustainability challenges on local and global scales. Her primary, primary interests are in solving water energy food challenges while reducing greenhouse gas emissions and reversing global warming. Specifically, Dr. Brennan's research team uses complex ecological systems to purify water and recover nutrients from waste streams. At the same time, they work to provide access to the fundamental human rights of water, energy, and food through the production of sustainable fertilizers, fodder, and biofuels. Dr. Brennan has a strong commitment to international education and outreach, particularly in developing countries and she recently served as a Fulbright Specialist at Columbia. Next, a bit about Divya. She's a senior in the Shire Honors College, majoring in chemistry with a minor in environmental engineering. She's also earning a certificate in Smeal Business Fundamentals. Divya has been an active participant in sustainability groups around campus, promoting grassroots advocacy and institutional change. Now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Brennan. After our speakers, we'll have a Q&A session and you'll also hear more about how your support can make a difference in Penn State distinguishing itself as the energy university. Dr. Brennan. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, first, uh, thank you, President Barron, for the very kind introduction. And also I'd like to thank the program organizers for inviting me to come and share some of our program objectives with you this evening. So as President Barron said, we have this tremendous opportunity at Penn State to really um, involve all of our colleges, campuses, and schools in this vision for Energy University. Um, what I'd like to do now is share with you a very broad encompassing vision that supports the vision for Energy University uh, by supporting excellence in research and education and service. So the important point of this is that it does this not 
only through energy research and education, but also through studying climate change solutions, which must go hand in hand with energy. So this broad initiative is really facilitated by student engagement, and this is the key. Um, and we do this through a program known as Drawdown. So what is Drawdown? So we all know that greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere have been climbing, and we collectively agree that we have to stop that. Um, but what is also important is that we don't just have to stop the emissions, but we actually have to reverse them to uh, restore ecological stability. Drawdown is the concept of bringing those emissions down. So Project Drawdown is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that uh, first released the book that you see there on your left in 2017 and followed it up with the Drawdown Review that was just um, released last year. And you can actually download that Drawdown Review free from their website, which is shown there. So I highly recommend that if you're interested. So Drawdown um, proposes a comprehensive plan for reversing global warming. And they do this through a variety of solutions that are not just technical, but also ecological and social. And they organize them into these three different sectors that you see here. So for example, reducing sources of emissions from things like buildings and electricity generation and agriculture, which is a huge contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. Also supporting sinks through ocean, land and engineered methods. And of course, very important, supporting social equality through health and education. At Penn State, we are the first university in the country to have the Drawdown Scholars Research Experiences for Undergraduates program. So we have partnered with Project Drawdown. We have a memorandum of understanding with them um, that says that we will facilitate this program and they will help support it. And our mission is to develop a diverse cohort of students that are informed agents of change that can address these cl complex global climate issues, both locally and regionally. So what we do is we actually have a nationwide call and we recruit the best of the best from all over the United States. We bring them in to Penn State for a 10 week immersive experience where they do not only contextual research, but we also put them through a series of uh, professional development trainings. Uh, for example, in leadership, for science communication, which is imperative um, with our climate challenges. Also, we touch on environmental justice and ethics and law and policy, and also give them some professional networking opportunities um, so that they can maintain those networks as they go throughout their career. And then also, we strongly encourage them to consider graduate school, particularly at Penn State. So in the past two years, we've had a variety of topics um, studied by our Drawdown Scholars. We've had over 70 students participate in the program to date. And these are some of the topics that our scholars have researched together with Penn State faculty and graduate students. So you can see in that list, there are, there are topics that do cover technical, ecological, and social solutions in those sectors we mentioned previously. Specifically, here are just some examples. Um, some of our scholars have focused on improving energy systems, for example, um, designing natural um, disaster resilient solar panels, which uh, you know, could have helped uh, in, in some recent weather we've had. Um, also studying how to make battery systems charge more quickly, enhancing building performance, not just reducing greenhouse gas emissions from buildings, but also studying how we can reduce the heat island effect from these buildings, enhancing carbon sequestration by uh, foresting marginal lands, um, studying how we can uh, um, improve our agricultural rotations for carbon sequestration and also uh, better environmental stewardship, and then also providing safe food and water resources by recovering and uh, recycling nutrients before they're lost into ecosystems and improving our stormwater retention facilities. So these are just some examples of the many different projects that we've supported through Drawdown Scholars. So um, as President Barron said, we're fortunate to have one of our Drawdown Scholars with us this evening. Um, Divya Jen actually worked with me um, this past year. So I'd like to invite her to share uh, her experiences in the program. Go ahead, Divya. 
Thanks for that introduction, Rachel. I am so happy that I get to be here tonight and share a little bit about the wonderful experience that I had one summer ago, the summer of 2020, um, as a Drawdown Scholar. So a little bit of an overview about my project. I was focused on reducing Penn State Dining's carbon footprint. And so through that program, I came up with a framework of kind of four different solutions in which I thought that dining can really attack these solutions in order to reduce it. And those were plant-based dining, purchasing more from our local Pennsylvanian suppliers, reducing food waste, from um, on campus and then also considered, considering alternative to go material options for when students take their food to go. And through these solutions, I essentially created a roadmap uh, report for dining as a framework that they can reduce their emissions. We can move on to the next slide. So there were a number of things that I gained from this program. And if I listed them all, the slide would have teeny, teeny, teeny font. <laughs> so I just chose a few important ones that I wanted to share with you. So one of the biggest things for me is that I was able to learn how to look at an organization, analyze their framework, and then figure out where solutions are going to fit in that framework so that it works for the organization and also reduce impact. I was also fortunate to be able to connect with other students from around the country and share my experiences and listen to theirs. I was also able to expand my relationships within the university in dining and um, build those relationships that as a student leader in sustainability I can use in the future as well. And then lastly, from this program, I had the opportunity to present this work at a national conference at well, as well, which helped um, connect me with an even broader network of sustainability engaged professionals. Great, thanks so much, Julia. So today, the Drawdown Scholars Program has been widely supported across Penn State. And so we love to see all of these different colleges and institutes, um, even the physical plant has been helping with some of our projects, which is amazing as we use our campus as a living laboratory. Um, and we hope that we get even more colleges um, supporting the program. But private philanthropy would really benefit us because Every year, it's sort of piecemeal. We go around and we try to get support um, from different colleges to support the scholars. And the program costs aren't trivial. So for each student, it costs approximately $12,000. And that doesn't include anything the, for the faculty. The faculty don't get any compensation whatsoever. So that money um, includes a travel budget to bring them to Penn State and a stipend, a weekly stipend while they're here working with us, as well as their lodging on campus and a meal plan. Um, what's very important is that we like to provide the costs in full for each participant because we are committed to including a diverse uh, population in our Drawdown Scholars. And it's very well known that um, encouraging underrepresented groups to have authentic research experiences really enhances their ability to complete their degrees and have higher academic achievement, um, as well as we know that a lot of our underrepresented groups come from lower income households. And by providing um, student fees and activities like this, we're uh, more likely to have a diverse representation in our program. So we'd like to continue offering um, the program free of charge to all of our participants. So the more uh, support we have, the more students we can involve, the more diversity, uh, more different perspectives we can bring in that can create creative and innovative solutions to these challenges that we're all facing. And endowed funding would be critical to establishing a permanent program so that we know that we can continue this year after year, especially at a time when it's uh, needed so much. So our vision, our big vision, um, is that Penn State would become the central hub for a nationally coordinated Drawdown Scholars program. So you can imagine we would still recruit nationally, um, but then we would have different 
um, institutions that would have specializations where drawdown scholars interested in those specific specialties could come. So Penn State could be the specialty for energy and we could recruit the best of the best to come here and research energy with our faculty and hopefully recruit them to graduate school. Um, we've also had discussions with other universities. For example, we could send students who are interested in um, sustainable building design to the University of Washington in Seattle, or we could send students interested in ocean sinks to Woods Hole Institute in Massachusetts. These are the kinds of things that we're thinking of on a big scale, and then we can collaborate across all of these different hubs and let the students share the information together, um, enhancing our collaboration and future opportunities. Um, in the end, coming together to have um, a culminating national conference and to um, publicize our results and share them with the world. So if you're interested in learning more, um, it, we do have a website online that shares some of the Drawdown Scholars projects from um, the last year. And we are planning right now for summer 2021. Um, so we're very excited to continue the program. Um, and your support would be um, amazing to ensuring that we can continue to recruit from diverse populations and um, have the program continue into the future. So thank you very much. Well, well, actually, thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Divya, for your uh, presentations tonight. And thank you, Dr. Barron, for sharing your vision for Energy University. Uh, I'll just remind folks that if you have questions uh, as we prepare to enter the Q&A session here, uh, you can enter them into the chat session. I think we've seen a couple of them that have already come in. Uh, and while I give, uh, give all of you a chance to, to get your questions keyed in, um, I'll just mention that, uh, you know, you've heard a theme tonight from Dr. Barron and from Rachel about the importance of philanthropy to, to the uh, efforts that we have underway associated with Energy University. You've heard, for example, that uh, for $12,000 uh, drawdown uh, uh, program, scholars program can welcome a new student. Um, so uh, a terrific opportunity if you want to expand the reach of that program to, to help us. But uh, you also heard Dr. Barron mention that we have 31 programs that uh, uh, are tied to Energy University. And so there are lots of, of opportunities for you if you're interested in supporting uh, this part of our campaign and, and our vision, bold vision for Energy University to, to be involved. We really uh, require philanthropy, I think, to help lead the university's vision towards an affordable, accessible, safe and clean energy future. And with your help, we're going to get there. So let me turn to, um, to uh, some of the questions that we've had. And uh, my first one actually uh, is for you, Divya. So um, uh, a question has come in about how the Drawdown Scholars Program has perhaps helped to shape your career objectives. What, what, uh, what impact has this program had as you've thought about what you'd like to do after Penn State? Yeah, so this program has actually really affected what my thoughts of what I want to do in the future. I would say so I did this program between my junior and senior year and my junior year I still wasn't really sure which direction I wanted to go in. But as a result of participating in this, as well as some other organizations, I realized that I really enjoy being able to look at an organization as a whole and then figure out where can this organization make changes to become more sustainable and to reduce their climate impact. And so I realized as a result of that, like I wanted to go into sustainability consulting and corporate sustainability. So in summary, I'd say that this program has been extremely influential. That's great. Thank you, Divya. I appreciate it. And thanks for being with us again tonight. Uh, Rachel, question for you uh, that, that came in from one of our uh, guests this evening. Could you elaborate on any research that Drawdown Scholar activities are having in the area of carbon capture, uh, specifically in major building components like concrete? Yeah, so we actually have a fairly um, well um, funded and publicized research program in building materials. So um, throughout the civil engineering program, we have several researchers that are looking into alternative cements. Um, and we had um, two, two scholars so far that have focused on alternative building materials. Um, one was on those alternative cements that I mentioned, and another one was um, using biomass for fiber reinforcement. 
So obviously the built environment is a, a huge contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. So anything that we can do within that built environment to reduce them um, can have very significant impact. Terrific, thanks, I, I appreciate that as well. And, and thanks also for being with us tonight. Uh, Dr. Barron, a couple questions for you. So uh, maybe, maybe from a 50,000 foot view, um, could you speak to the role that the social sciences and the humanities might play as Penn State seeks to become an energy university or the energy university? You're on mute. Hey. So, it, you know, it's, a, it, it's an interesting, um, it, it's an interesting fact that as we work to predict the future and move forward, uh, we have one of the, uh, the great components that often completely alters our, our predictions, and that's human behavior. And uh, so how humans respond to different things becomes an important topic, how it is that, that humans uh, sense and are educated on these different topics uh, has an influence on, on their decisions and their commitments as to things like uh, ethics and uh, uh, their, their own personal environment. And so I, I would say that it's actually very difficult um, to, to just look at this issue as a science and technology issue. You have to, you have to couple it with human behavior. Um, so it's not at all a surprise uh, to me that communication sciences, social sciences <coughs> start to play a significant role if you're going to do this right. So there was a, there was a question early in the program tonight, uh, Dr. Barron, that I think is also uh, maybe for you, but certainly Rachel or Divya could, could weigh in if they want. Uh, and that was the that, that question had to do if if as we've thought about energy university <laughs> there are any touch points or initiatives at Penn State around energy security which uh, Rachel touched on briefly when she talked about uh, disaster resistant solar panels but you know I think we've just seen what happens when we have uh, uh, a failure of energy security in Texas for example um, is that a is that a topic that Penn State is working on. So anyone can answer. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm 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 sorry. I I was I was looking at the chat instead <laughs> instead of listening to you. So do you uh, need me to repeat the question? I, I do. Okay. So so the question was as we've as we have as you have envisioned Penn State as the energy university. Are, are there any touch points in our work around uh, energy security? Uh, and, and Rachel touched on disaster resistant solar panels in her comments, but I wonder if there's, if there's more perhaps uh, or, or other examples of work that we're doing in that area. Well, look, first of all, look at the way energy security is, is defined uh, as abundant, as affordable uh, and, and safe. So there's a tremendous scope of of uh, activities in, in all of those that come from exploration to extraction, to doing it efficiently, to uh, climate change, carbon sequestration, and others that, uh, that, that are focused on making sure that it's, it's safe, environmentally safe. Um, but there are also all sorts of other different components. Uh, you know, I, I love the idea of, uh, of a weather resistant um, solar panels, uh, but just look how important the energy grid was in the state of Texas as an example and, and realize not just the fact that its existence is there and that it's robust, which gives you a level of energy security, but also think of it in terms of how smart systems like that can be in terms of the energy demand and the communication in a grid. So that type of activity and energy systems type activity could also have a, a profound impact. So I, I, I see this as, as the broadest of questions for which um, 
the vast majority of the research activities are contributing in one fashion or another uh, to energy security. Rachel, anything you want to you'd care to add to that? And if not, I should warn you next questions for you and Divya. I think President Barron answered that very well. If, if we want to get in another question or two, that, that'd be great. Great. Okay. So, so uh, we had a question a moment ago from uh, from Scott Steinhauer, who's asking: Is there if is there if there is anything that Penn State or other institutions can do to elevate market soluble issues and contribute to visibility for quicker solutions with respect to to drawdown of uh, greenhouse gas reduction? But I love this question. It's almost like I planted it. <laughs> so. <laughs> Scott, for that question. So we are actually in the pro process of developing our next phase for drawdown, and that is developing a center focused specifically on climate solutions that would engage with industries, government agencies, uh, private businesses to help them achieve their climate reduction targets. Um, it serves more as a consultancy for the world. We have this portfolio of amazing expertise here at Penn State, but a lot of uh, companies and industries, uh, government agencies don't know how to achieve their targets. They don't know what could be low hanging fruit for them. So if they come to our, our center and they, they say here, this is what we do, how, what should we do? What, what are the most cost effective ways that we can improve our energy efficiency, our materials use, how can we get carbon neutral by 2030? And then we can we can have our um, wonderful faculty here uh, help them achieve those goals. So that to me, um, for rapid implementation of solutions is um, one of the, the best ways that we can do that is to get our faculty out there in front and, and helping the people who um, want to make it happen. Also to add there from a student perspective, since Penn State is an educational institution and a research institution, speaking as a student, there is so much that I have learned through my curriculum and through my research. And I think that Penn State is adding on more and more climate and sustainability education. And by teaching that to students, then students can in turn go out into the world and understand, okay, in my career, you know, I have XYZ options, let me focus on what is the most sustainable option in terms of in not only environmentally, but also economically and socially. That's great. So, so uh, Dr. Barron, back to you, one of the, the hallmarks of your presidency at Penn State has been the work that you've done around economic development to support uh, uh, job and business growth in the Commonwealth. How do you think Energy University plays into the economic development vision for the Commonwealth? So again, I, I would tackle it from, from a, a really broad set of issues. So let's take the example that Rachel described of, of alternative cements. And this is something that becomes patentable and marketed and uh, it is fostered through Invent Penn State, perhaps as a startup or as a license uh, or, or as, a, as a, uh, a, a sale of a product to a, a corporation that's capable of producing it. So this is at the core of, of Invent Penn State um, in, in terms of getting our intellectual property all these wonderful things that are coming out of all these different sectors into the market. But I think you could look at it from another end, uh, a, a, a different perspective. And that is why shouldn't energy intensive companies be attracted to the energy state of Pennsylvania? So there are a lot of, of high, um, high energy intensive businesses for which you might imagine all sorts of efficiencies that are developed through and, and operational efficiencies that are developed through, through things that, that are happening at Penn State, but also why, why be thinking about the transmission and shipping of that energy elsewhere, which could not be as safe uh, potentially. So here's another opportunity that you have 
to look at those industries and say, why don't you sit next to the source as, as, opposed, as opposed to to building it somewhere else? Um, I'll give you just an example. Uh, uh, data, data centers are incredibly energy intensive and, and there's not much choice these days other than having them energy intensive. So why do we want to build that someplace else and, and, and not, not, uh, not, not have it close to the source of, of the energy or not have it next to that solar farm? It turns out Pennsylvania is a wonderful place for a solar farm. Uh, I, I wouldn't have known that, but the technology is advanced to the point where it can. So I, I hopefully that just gives you a perspective that this is, this is everything from that big picture of being in a, a state with a lot of energy all the way to that transfer of intellectual property uh, at Penn State in, into the energy into energy fields. Yeah, I think anybody who spent a winter in Pennsylvania would uh, would agree with you that you wouldn't your your first inclination wouldn't be to think of Pennsylvania as a solar energy uh, hub, <laughs> but uh, sure enough, um, Rachel, a question for you uh, that's interesting. Um, so so one of our uh, guests tonight has asked uh, kind of a provocative question, I think. Uh, is this is all terrific, uh, he says, but it, are, are we perhaps too late? So as you think about, you know, as as the climate warms and we see, for example, the tundra melting and the release of carbon dioxide from from the tundra, um, are, are we at a point where perhaps it's it's too challenging to to actually affect drawdown in the way you've described it? No, absolutely not. So that's the one thing that we have to not do is have this um, doomsday mentality. So we do still have time, um, but there is urgency. And is, as long as we can instill that education broadly and empower people to take action through their, not just their own, you know, individual habits, but also, um, you know, larger corporations, industries have a huge impact. And how do we as the public influence those corporations? We influence them with where we choose to spend our money. So um, that combination with our suite of opportunities across technical, ecological, and social sectors, we have so much that we can do. And there's so much that everyone can do, regardless of um, education or specialty, there are things that, that everyone can contribute in reversing climate change. So absolutely not too late. So, so there may be a, a, a tag on to, the, to your answer right now with this next question, which is uh, given Penn State's standing as, a, as, a, as one of the premier land grants in the nation, how will our natural gas resources be prioritized for research responsible stewardship and development, uh, perhaps in keeping with some of those objectives? Mm. I'll ask all, maybe all three of you if you have comments on that. I would actually defer more to President Barron on that question, um, as he's had a lot of experience navigating those waters. Yeah, so so I, I'm not. I, I'd have to think about prioritization for research, but but I think um, I think the 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 wonderful thing and another example about Penn State's breadth and 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 depth is that that we have the geoscientists that were the first to define what the volume of natural gas uh, existed in Pennsylvania. And among other things in that abundance was a switch uh, for, for Penn State from coal to natural gas, which is responsible for one of those big step downs in our total uh, greenhouse emissions. Another one is, is bringing on a solar solar farm that steps it down uh, e even, uh, even further. So at the very same time, we have groups of scientists that are measuring emissions, uh, meteorology faculty measuring emissions to, to understand um, where there might be leaks, how it is that you might fix them, whether or not there are different uh, policies in terms of, of uh, instead of regulating every single joint, uh, in a long transmission cycle, 
to have a baseline and and uh, understand what uh, and, and and make sure that the operator keeps below a particular level rather than regulating every single uh, piece of it. This might be something that's a much more effective strategy to folks that are looking at whether or not there are significant changes in uh, in in water resources that are associated with energy production. So, so it is really that full perspective that Penn State has in terms of uh, almost end to end of, of abundance and affordability to safety and that, that I think makes the difference and, and I hopefully is a good answer to that question. Actually, as you were giving that answer, I was thinking, wow, aren't we fortunate to have a president who can just respond to a question like that uh, unprompted with no notes? So, yes, I thought that was a good answer. Uh, uh, I, I do have one more for you, uh, Dr. Barron, and that's that that uh, harkens back to your slide that showed the uh, trajectory that we're on to reduce energy emissions uh, on our campuses. Uh, and the question was, is, is there any specific goal to, to reach net zero for university buildings? And if so, what does that look like? Yeah, so, you know, a lot of people sign on to goals by a particular time frame. I always worry about sitting there and saying, here's the target and then leaving it to somebody else to get there. I'm not sure they'll thank me after that I've, I've gone and I've I've seen a lot of university presidents saying, here's what we're gonna do. And, and then the next president comes along and goes, uh, she said, what? He said, what I I'm supposed to do by a particular time period. So what I would rather do, and actually we're in the midst of st stepping up a group, we just have a, a, a few parts of a faculty assignment to say, what is our best ability to lower our greenhouse uh, emissions, uh, where, where are the options and opportunities and therefore come up with a realistic estimate of what we might be able to do. And as I said, we're uh, ahead of schedule uh, here in terms of what Pennsylvania was asking of us. I think we can do much better than that, uh, uh, that as well. We have some challenges. Uh, because if, if you look at that graph, one of the areas of that graph was transportation, for which we're looking at the transportation of our faculty and staff, for which even at University Park, we're drawing faculty and staff from a broad area around the region. How can you alter uh, the, the emissions of, of that faculty and staff that have to travel in order to get to work? Because we're not in a county uh, for which you can walk. And so that's an area of challenge. And maybe our transportation systems focus uh, will begin to, to alter that in a certain way. But part of that is out of our hands because it's decisions by, by the individuals. On the other hand, um, with that solar farm, uh, Penn State has moved to be slightly majority uh, renewables. This is a huge step. Uh, forward uh, and, and has actually happened very quickly uh, for this university over the last five years, eight years. So, um, so you know, our, our view is let's get together the team of experts and let's set the path for Penn State based on what we believe we can actually do and, and those areas for which we can actually influence. And then how do you compensate for those areas for which we don't actually have the control uh, over what those emissions might be like? And that may, that may lead us right down the path of, of, uh, of, um, of, of uh, carbon sequestration sinks and other areas for which hopefully we might be able to get some credit for in order to have that, uh, that balance out. But we're, we're about to take a very realistic look at this and update what it is that, that we did several years ago that was embodied in that graph. Great, thank, thank you for that, I appreciate it. 
So we have, I, I'm mindful of the time, we're a couple minutes before nine o'clock and, uh, and we have gone through all of the questions that have been submitted. So I'm gonna take uh, MC uh, executive privilege and take a hard left turn here um, with one last question for all four of you. And that's, uh, we, we're you know in the middle of March, which is March madness. And of course we have our creamery flavor madness right now underway. And so my question for all of you is, which creamery flavor are you voting for? Rachel. What are the, I don't know what they are. <laughs> I'm like Molly. I don't know what they are. I don't know what What's your favorite? What, okay. Um, I like Death by Chocolate. Swirl. <laughs> Alumni Swirl. <laughs> Alumni Swirl for Molly. Death by Chocolate for Rachel. A lot of vote for Alumni Swirl for me as well. Alumni Swirl for you. <laughs> Dr. Barron. I, I like alumni swirl, but uh, I had to predict the uh, the, the uh, creamery ice cream challenge last year, and I saw the writing on the wall and chose death by, by chocolate. chocolate, which did win as most popular. So do we do we have a two two tie death by chocolate Excellent. and alumni swirl, or Excellent. did alumni swirl win by three? <laughs> <laughs> well, Either way, I think you're probably going to end up being happy with your choice. So uh, th thanks for that. Creamery. Olivia, thanks so much for being on the program this evening. And Dr. Barron, thanks for sharing your vision for Energy University with our guests. Thanks to all of you for joining us tonight to learn more about the work that we're doing with Energy University at Penn State and how you can help to advance, uh, advance that work and help us to impact the world. Uh, we look forward to seeing how Penn State continues uh, to advance its interdisciplinary research expertise through programs like Energy University with the, the help that all of you provide to us. Uh, I hope that uh, until the next time we are gathered together, <laughs> I'm sorry, I just saw the chat that said, I vote for any creamery ice cream. We are, thank you. That's a great, that's a great answer. Uh, um, I, ho I hope that until the next time that we are gathered together, uh, uh, which will probably be remotely for the next time, but but uh, but soon enough, we'll hopefully be back together again. Until then, I hope that you all stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, if you celebrate tomorrow, happy St. Patrick's Day a little bit early. Have a wonderful evening. We're really excited that you were able to be with us tonight. We are. <laughs>